Reports. Is that what you mentioned, Consumer Reports? 1995, Martin Seligman and some other researchers helped Consumer Reports do a psychotherapy satisfaction study. It's interesting. Take a look. Um, is, is research uh, in these areas constrained by the sort of um, the pharmaceutical orientation of a lot of the medical business? I mean, it sounds like the center of your focus in each of your cases uh, is not really directly related to altering people's chemistry and more about the way they see things and how well they see them. Uh, it, it seems like the majority of interest is following money, which is largely in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, does that conflict with the ability to have studies done to get more information about uh, clinical uh, potential? No. <laughs> that, that isn't the big problem with clinical studies. The big problem with clinical studies generally is they're bloody impossible to do. It's really hard to find the subjects. It's even harder to figure out who the controls should be. So I don't think it's a funding problem. I don't think there's much evidence that making, like providing more money for research has any real massive bearing on how quickly it progresses. Um, I mean, in the US, for example, researchers spend like 40% of their time writing grants. It's like, it would have been better just to not give them any bloody money to begin with. And then they'd be thinking, well, I mean it. It's like 40%. It's, it's, it's just appalling. So, and you can make a lot of headway without very much money, you know. So, and I don't think anybody's prejudices are slowing things up. It's just clinical work is, well, all, one thing I would say is you basically have to be insane to do it. <laughs> like, if you're, if you're a researcher, it's so difficult. It can take you, like, five years to do a clinical study. You can do, like, 30 personality or social studies in the same time frame. It's just so hard. And uh, it's the real difficulty of doing it that is just makes progress creep along. That and the categorical problems. So, Anybody else? Want to? Another question? He hasn't seen it, so I can start there. <laughs> I just wanted to be a little antagonistic. Good. Would each of you uh, care to talk about anything that any of the others talked about today that you didn't really <laughs> agree with? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to answer. <laughs> I, I had a thought uh, about uh, part of Jordan's talk in, 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 in terms of uh, moral avoidance and psychopathology. Now, uh, uh, Jung has this, this kind of assertion, and, and he uses the, uses the word opus in it, and what he means by that, life's work or individuation. He says, the opus consists of three parts, insight, endurance, and action. Uh, psychology plays a role in the first element, but in the second and third, moral strength plays the predominant role. So I think partly he's talking about the limits of psychology, but also there's the issue, what does he mean by moral strength? And so... so in terms of our own lives or the lives of our patients, we, we come to an insight. We know what we need to do. Are we totally free to do that or not do that? If our patients, we think, see what they need to do but don't do it, what's our reaction to that? It's just kind of an open-ended thing. <laughs> A rebuttal? <laughs> no, no. I mean, that seems about. This is what well, I can add something to. This is why the Puritans believed in predestination, right? It's like, okay, um, what if someone won't do what they need to do? Is that a form of pathology? Do they have a choice? I mean, who knows? It's it's not easy to figure out. And there's this there's this element in human behavior that 
that's associated with consciousness and that's associated with whatever it is that we are able to choose. We'll be able to choose. We don't understand that. And we don't know the constraints or limitations on that. We don't even know how to conceptualize it because it certainly isn't a deterministic idea. Um, so I guess all I'm saying about that is this idea of moral strength is an un unanswered um, problem. And it isn't a disagreement. Um, I'm just wondering what you guys think about the uh, legitimacy or illegitimacy of disorders like ADD and ADHD, uh, because you hear a lot of things uh, that, you know, the, well, I do anyways, that, uh, you know, Aaron and I actually last night were talking about uh, how we were sort of skeptical uh, about how legitimate they were as actual disorders, but obviously neither of us are really qualified to make those uh, judgments. So I'm just wondering what you guys uh, think about that. Are they legitimate uh, disorders in your opinion or are they sort of on the fringe uh, in terms of uh, the, their legitimacy? Right. Amphetamines make people concentrate better. So, and some people can concentrate better than others. And that's about that. I mean, if you can concentrate better, you do better in school. If you take amphetamines, you can concentrate better. Is that good? Depends on how you define good. And you know, and is it a disorder? Depends on how you define disorder. If you give rats amphetamines, it suppresses their play. And then they'll sit there and learn like good rats. And if you do that, <laughs> if you do that to boys in particular, then they concentrate and they quit playing. Now, if that's good if you think that playing isn't. And it's bad if you think that playing is useful. Uh, Panksep has shown that if you give male rats, juveniles, amphetamines, it stops them from playing, and that makes their prefrontal cortex mature slowly. So it's a mismatch, right? I mentioned earlier, mental disorder is like a mismatch. The behavior and the situation don't jive. School is no place for really playful, active kids. It's probably no place for kids, period. But <laughs> it's certainly no place for really active kids. And amphetamines will definitely calm people down, weirdly enough, because it makes them concentrate. But it works for normal people, too. Normal. It's a sociocultural phenomena. Um, but your point does raise an, uh, another issue in addition to what Jordan said that, um, like all disorders in, in DSM four, and Jordan spoke about that. It's really they're, they're really lousy at defining them, and and they are under the influence of culture and politics and fadism. Um, and they come and go in, 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 their, in their popularity. I think this is one of them that might kind of straddle. It's like, you know, there's something there maybe, but probably it's being maybe overdiagnosed or completely not well formulated, and the symptoms don't capture the whole phenomenon. It takes a long time to get it right in, 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 you know, in, in psychiatry and psychology, and I think Terry mentioned this morning, it's a very young science anyway. Um, DSM is, all, is a new thing, to a new manual. It's only been around a few, a few, a few decades. Um, and so there are a lot of mistakes in it. I think um, uh, that all the personality disorders, for example, all the access to, are all, could be easily challenged with the same kind of question. Do these things really exist? A lot of them are going to be uh, uh, kicked out of, of, of DSM-5. Um, they, they, they're always undergoing change. Uh, even the ones that we think we know a lot about, like uh, addiction and, and mood disorders and anxiety disorders, they shift depending on more data. So that, again, the answer to those questions will be data, will be those, those longer studies, uh, maybe biologically informed, um, sometimes reflecting the culture where kids are, are in conditions that foster a particular disorder to be easily diagnosed. All those factors come into it, but um, there's no way to answer those questions in a, in a kind of a, a one-shot deal. It's, it's time and money investment of, of that energy over time to really be able to describe the animal, if there is one, and not mislabel the animal with a whole bunch of other, other uh, names that confuse it and make it impossible to diagnose. Okay, so unfortunately, we're very nearly out of time, um, which has more or less convinced me that next time I need to schedule two or three days to grill you, not just as one. Um, but uh, I'll just close out with one more question. We've uh, spent all day talking about different, uh, different modes and aspects of psychopathology, uh, and I wanted to kind of close out on a positive note and ask each of you, briefly speaking, 
what your personal vision of wellness is in the mental sense, very briefly. Uh, and, uh, and if people could do one thing to kind of move themselves, one thing to move themselves towards that vision of wellness, what would it be? People should strive to tell the truth. Yeah, it's hard to beat that. <laughs> they should act. I think a lot of the issues um, bear on the fact that we no longer have sort of a unified cultural framework. I mean, we're all post-Christian in some way or other. Even if we're adherents to Christianity, I'm not. But, um, and I think we've got to get down to the very serious work of trying to come to some consensus of how we're going to figure out what's meaningful to us as people. And we've got to stop avoiding that and stop pretending that we'll somehow solve it just by collecting data. I didn't mean to fight against your point. <laughs> Right, but if we don't get this project underway, if we don't face the meeting crisis and make it a priority, the way people like Nicholas Maxwell have been arguing since 1984, we're in deep shit. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, well, since uh, Jordan's comment um, got so much applause, I also think truth is important. <laughs> <laughs> but with a, with a little bit of extra. Um, I think it's exa that actually summarizes really that last slide that I showed in my presentation about um, the Buddhist uh, process, which is to correct distortion and uh, the taming of mind or training of mind, which is really another way of, of, of doing that. And if you had operationalized it, if there was one thing that people could do, would be probably to slow, I, I, would, I would say, it's a throwaway, you know, throwaway idea, would be to be cautious about believing their own beliefs and thoughts just because they had them. That somehow that, that's not the way the truth is to believe it. And there's a little bit of kind of, a bit of a reflection before you, uh, you give that confidence. That's, that doesn't produce truth, but at least it's on the way of, of at least not continuing with the, the self-deceptions that normally characterize our lives. Um, did you want to add to that? Oh, okay. No, that's well, okay. I, the only thing else I'd say is, and this is an elaboration on the same statement, it's like there's this idea, I don't remember, who, I think it was Habermas, I think, came up with this. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it, it was the idea of performative contradiction. And a performative contradiction is a lie, except it's the sort of lie where you say one thing and do the other. And so when, when I say that people should try to tell the truth, it's, it's, it's complicated, right? Because you can also tell the truth in a manner that deliberately hurts people. That's not really telling the truth. And you can say the truth and act in a different way, and that's that performative contradiction. That's a form of lie, too. And so telling the truth and acting it out are equally important. And, you know, we often, because we're so concerned with representation, we don't often think enough about action. So speaking and acting in the manner that you think is the closest to truth you can imagine I think Tony's comment is dead on because, you know, even if you think you're telling the truth, what you're doing is something incomplete. And so it's, it's, it's more like a process. Telling the truth is more like a process than a state. You're thinking, well, I'm, I know I'm clueless as hell and I'm probably wrong, but this is what I think is going on. And, you know, I, maybe I'll listen to you even if I can't stand you because there's always the chance you know something I don't. And so then when you tell the truth, you make a friend of what you don't know instead of making a friend of what you know. And since there's way more of what you don't know, you're on way solider ground. And that really is a flip in viewpoint, right? It's the exact opposite of a totalitarian viewpoint. Because totalitarians are in love with what they know. But it's better to be in love with what you don't know. You'll never run out of it. So... 